Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's one of my good friends and mentors, Eric Dubin of the News Doctors, editor of the News Doctors. Thank you for joining us again, Eric. Oh, it's great to be here, Jason. Thanks for inviting me. Now, um, Eric, before we talk about the markets and the economy, let, let's talk about U.S. foreign policy. Um, it, it's kind of head-scratching to me what's been going on for the last 10, 12, 15 years. Um, is, is there any logic or rationality to the U.S.'s foreign policy? It depends on who uh, you're talking about in terms of designing uh, you know, strategies and contingencies and whatnot. But... Uh, there's a strategy. There's a cohesiveness to it. it. The logic behind it is essentially kind of along the lines of what um, Pepe Escobar, a uh, famous writer in Asian Times, spoke about in terms of chaos. I mean, it's an empire of chaos, his latest book, I believe, is titled. And it is a form of a divide-and-conquer strategy where, um, you know, the United States represents roughly 5% of the population. And consumes roughly 20% of the world's resources and uh, has uh, the largest economy, uh, depending on how you measure it. I mean, China is now uh, very close in terms of our economic size. But to maintain uh, that kind of an empire, and indeed the United States is an empire, uh, it requires not just direct military force and economic dominance over markets and so on, but also uh, a kind of destabilization of nations that help bring about um, alliances and geopolitical um, partnerships with countries around the world that, in fact, uh, support the United States empire. So <laughs> we freely use chaos as a way of, in fact, bringing about order. And that's nothing new. I mean, it, it, it's uh, age-old um, in terms of you know, how humans and tribes even millennia past uh, went about going and procuring their resources versus competing tribes and whatnot. But in, in the modern era, I mean, it's probably best defined by what the British Empire developed. When the sun never set on the British Empire, uh, a tiny island nation uh, with a very small population vis-a-vis -vis all the various countries that it had dominated was, for the most part, uh, able to be kept together for 100-plus years precisely from the same kind of divide and conquer and forming of alliances and setting tribes and ethnic groups and uh, interests and so forth against each other in various nation states. And, you know, you need to only look at the, at the Middle East right now and the latest example being Yemen where, uh, you know, the, the Houthi uh, tribe has basically kicked out the client um uh, uh, Al Nader, president uh, that was working in cahoots with the Saudi Arabians and in turn uh, aligned with the United States. So, you know, these kind of <laughs> skirmishes that go on. Uh, another example being, you know, what's going on in, in Syria and the U.S. objective of trying to send uh, ISIL fighters uh, to try to topple Syria is another form of uh, just stirring the pot and divide and conquer strategy and pursuant to our, well, I say our, but, you know, the U.S. Uh, geopolitical interests. And it's, it's an off-the-shelf technique to bring about chaos in order to bring order. Yeah, I actually just read The Prince. I, I think I read it in high school or college, but I don't think I was paying that much attention to it. I don't know if I fully read it, and I may have just, you know, bought, like, some um, some Cliff Notes version for it <laughs> or, or gotten some notes from some other friends and study groups. But I actually thoroughly re uh, read the whole book, um, you know, an audio book uh, last week or two. Yeah. And um, it, it definitely seems in there talking about the U.S. is very Machiavellian in his foreign policy where, you know, it lies a lot to the public and the stuff behind the, the, the public is like scratching their heads for what we're told in the public because, you know, their actions of the government doesn't match what they're telling us. And from what it seems like, Eric, it seems like you said divide and conquer. I mean, the Romans did the strategy. The Romans would often fund both sides in a satellite or proxy area. A, a, a satellite territory or proxy area that they ultimately wanted to take over, but they would fund, you know, leaders on both sides, and they would fight with each other, weaken each other, and then the Romans would just bring the legions right in and just flatten both, um, and they would get the puppets they want and all the control they want ultimately later in the long term. It seems, you know, the long game, the long chess play, 
uh, or the Chinese, uh, I forget the, the Chinese specific game that the Chinese play. It's a, it's a long military board game. Right, yeah. And the Roman act, you know, example, historically, uh, has overtures to what, you know, we saw in Great Britain in particular, but the United States as well. You know, the empire that took over the entire Mediterranean, both North Africa all the way up to Spain and Portugal and further on out to the Fertile Crescent and uh, uh, the Middle East area. And so, you know, this small nation of Italy and uh, the limited number of centurions and soldiers within the Roman uh, army were able to, in fact, take over a huge area of land, way disproportionate to the size of Rome. And that just speaks to the power of the model. It works, and so we're using a version of it right now. Yeah, and um, I, I saw this interesting movie, I think it was with Pierce Brosnan, uh, it was like the November Man, and they had like a CIA, uh, like one of the CIA, uh, heads of the CIA agents in the movie, um, he wasn't a real CIA agent, but I guess maybe they had done background work, and he was like, we, the CIA used to collect information, he was like, that's old, he was like, information's okay now, he was like, mostly we just collect people, <laughs> he was like, we just control people, he was like, puppets, he was like, that's how we run the world. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, information is definitely a lever point that allows control over uh, peoples and countries, but uh, you know, the CIA is known for recruiting assets. Uh, that, that, that activity is actually far more uh, representative of the overall work that the um, organization does, that and the data intelligence and whatnot, than covert actions and overthrowing governments and things like that. I mean, that's what gets the James Bond uh, headlines and so forth and spotlight, but the, the realities are such that their their work is more you know, you just bare bones, basic stuff of intelligence graph. But, you know, we should probably back up a step and talk a little bit about what's happened in the last 14, 15, so on years, because you referenced that, and, and the main change on the world stage is that the Soviet Union fell apart, and in 1989, uh, 1990, uh, there were a lot of transitions within the geopolitical intelligentsia community uh, and think tanks and so forth, uh, and State Department policy and development under presidents, uh, on and on, that basically focused on trying to establish the United States as a unipolar power that controlled uh, the overall world. And uh, in 1992, we had Paul Wolfowitz, uh, developed the Wolfowitz document under the Clinton administration that uh, laid out a strategy for preventing any power within the Asian continent and for the uh, former Soviet Union to not, in fact, be able to reestablish itself as a counterbalance to the power of the United States. And, you know, we've had periods of warm relationships or warm relations with Russia in periods where, like now, we've had a lot of friction. And the tenor of uh, the overall policy that the United States has maintained against Russia has been consistent throughout that entire period, and that's expansion of NATO uh, countries on the perimeter of Russia and uh, advocacy for the rebooting of a, a first-strike nuclear capability within our own doctrine, um, anti-ballistic missile shield uh, development within Poland and uh, other alternatives uh, justified on uh, the spurious notion of trying to say that you know, we're going to guard against ballistic missiles from Iran when, in fact, you're putting anti-ballistic missile systems in, on Poland on the border of Russia. I mean, you know, we've had a very um, overall militarily antagonistic um, policy and doctrine up and running against Russia the entire time that we've had even periods where warm relations are, are occurring. So uh, it's all about trying to maintain the United States as uh, the one sole superpower with the ability to dominate um, over economic interests and secure our own national security interests. And you know, the, we are no longer in a unipolar world economically. That's just uh, prima facie evidence. Anyone can see that. And there are three forms of general power that you know, underpin nation states in their geopolitical uh, ability to project power abroad, and that's economic, military, and moral authority. And we are suffering on all three fronts at this point. So, I mean, we're, we're definitely seeing major changes in the world. And instead of trying to, like what China does in terms of going 
about making uh, the world better and more fluid for business and building up relationships and co-opetition as opposed to competition, you know, we're kind of stuck in the mode of uh, the sole superpower trying to maintain uh, its uh, control over um, the domain that we've had over a period of time, and, and, and that's, that's diluting as we go forward in history. Yeah, the the U.S. is just bent on you know more military spending and keeping keeping the um trying to maintain the status quo at all costs. Um, I live right outside of D.C. as you know, and um a, a lot of the think tank people, the neocons, the intelligentsia as you called it, the people who work for who who get paid big bucks to advise for the State Department or for the Pentagon. You know, they're not actually in the military, but they get advised on policy decisions. A lot of these people were young adults when the Soviet Union was still going, so you know they studied in Russian studies, learned how to speak Russian. Um, studies uh, Russian history, and you know when the Soviet Union collapsed, they kind of um, you know they were scrambling. They weren't getting as much work. They weren't getting paid as much. So I, I think there is just because they studied so much the enemy that they were looking for ghosts and chasing after them, um, trying to project new enemies and things like that. That Russia was the threat and things like that. So I, I think they've even though the Soviet Union fell, I think you know in between that time and now, I think they've always hated the Soviet Union, always kept an eye on them and you know, thought that they could always be the threat. But I, I think Putin just wants to mostly trade. I, I don't see, um, you know, Putin wanting to start World War III. Um, it seems maybe you cover a lot of these news stories. It seems that NATO and the Soros' private army and some other people involved out of the West, the Western political elites, they seem to be trying to poke the bear, you know, Vladimir Putin and Russia, wake him up, get him angry, provoke him into potentially starting a war, starting, I guess, in the Ukraine. Yeah, and... It may not be entirely that a lot of these policy thinkers uh, specifically want to have war outright with Russia. It's just that they would like to see the Ukraine within the European Union and NATO. And pursuant to that goal, uh, about, well, it actually goes back to 2004, there was the first color revolution in the Ukraine, and uh, we've had a kind of back and forth with the West when it, when it comes to Ukraine integrating with the European Union economy. And uh, most recently, the uh, Madan uh, Square protests were facilitated by uh, you know, Central Intelligence Agency and probably uh, NATO as well. Uh, and we have uh, documents that speak to this and even a voice recording with uh, Assistant Secretary of European Affairs, Victoria Newland, talking about how uh, they'd like to see uh, you know, a certain guy, Yats, as a prime minister and picking and choosing leaders after the coup. And uh, you know, over the course of that 2004 to 2014 period, they spent like $5 billion to uh, and going back to the analogy of what the Romans would do, you know, going court, local, power, uh, interests and set them off against others and create a civil war and, and in the hopes of having the Ukrainian uh, country uh, fold into the NATO alliance. And, and in a nutshell, even though Americans are being fed this gigantic diet of propaganda about what's really going on in the Ukraine, the realities are such that uh, the conflict there has been largely fostered and facilitated by the United States. And NATO in turn, and uh, Putin and Russia in general is, uh, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a country that spans, I think, like 11 time zones. I mean, it's the largest country in the world in terms of land mass. Uh, to argue that, or to argue that, that Putin is out to build uh, a new empire when uh, Russia can barely manage its own resources and its own land mass and grow its own economy within its own borders is just silly. I mean, it, it, Russia has made many overtures to the West and has attempted to ingratiate itself into the West. And uh, There was a period where it looked like that was going to advance. Uh, Russia became one of the G, or was added to the G7, and uh, the international relations circuit uh, freely embraced Russia and even Putin at one point. But all of that's changed now because uh, there are interests that like to see war, uh, conflict, it, it helps facilitate the military industrial complex. And at the same time, there's this old Wolfowitz doctrine just echoing throughout history that basically calls for um, the ring-fencing of Russia and also 
uh, China. China is in the same uh, frame when it comes to aggressive neocon ideology as far as, you know, checkmating the ultimate enemy. Because, you know, now we hear a lot about Putin, but, you know, five years from now, uh, who knows? You know, it, it, the headlines may be focused more so on China than Putin as being the embodiment of Satan. And Newsweek covers with him with nuclear explosions and his sunglasses and so forth. I mean, it's, it's, it's astounding the degree to which this propaganda meme has been so consistent. But I don't think I've ever seen this level of propaganda about any particular subject um, ever in my life in studying geopolitics for 25 plus years. This is just astounding what's going on when it comes to the, the way in which and the aggressiveness with which the West is attempting to paint uh, Putin as the grand boogeyman. I mean, it's nothing like 1990 with Saddam Hussein being the, the embodiment of Hitler and so on and so forth. And isn't it amusing that, you know, in our foreign policy establishment, the very well-worn path of calling our next enemy the embodiment of Hitler is something that comes and goes uh, pretty consistently throughout time. Well, there's a lot of historical examples of, you know, right before war, war, how the propaganda really starts to come out. I mean, didn't the British, didn't the British start calling before World War One? They said the Germans were murdering babies and yeah. things like that. So there was, there's always been propaganda. I mean, one thing I've learned and I've read a lot of history, and I know you like history too, is, you know, anytime a government wants a war, they always, you know, ramp up the propaganda. Or if the government knows the economy is about to go in the tank, they start to ramp up the propaganda to, uh, to get the people. Uh, siding with the government so they can blame the economic problems or the other problems in society on some other group, normally, you know, foreigners or something like that. Yeah, it's, it, it's certainly nothing new, uh, but the degree to which electronic media is so concentrated with five, con with five companies uh, controlling like 95% or so of the mainstream, uh, the level of understanding in the American public now and of willingness to just swallow this stuff without any critical thinking is at a all-time high. I, I don't yeah, I, I, I agree, Eric. And most of the people I know, they don't even spend any time, you know, reading the news. And if they do read the news, um, you know, non-libertarian people, you know, outside of the people listening to this podcast who are well-informed. But, you know, the regular mainstream people that I still have, you know, consider acquaintances or friends – you know, that they, they don't have time. They're so busy putting food on the table or just trying to keep their full-time job or maybe a girlfriend or, or a wife or something happy, maybe they're starting a family, that they don't have time to look into any of these things. So they, they watch the news for, for five or ten minutes, and they, they, they mistakenly put their trust into the mainstream media that they're not getting full propaganda. I mean, look at Hillary Clinton, right? How many scandals does Hillary, has Hillary Clinton had? She should probably be in prison. For um for at least a couple of her scandals, right. uh maybe even for life, and yet you know she's probably gonna um you know she's running for president now. It seems the elites wanna um wanna put her in that seat again for president. Yes, she would be a good bureaucrat for serving all the oligarchical interests. I mean, uh, she's proven herself very well, and uh, you know, the if you would put on a chart the uh, donations going to the Clinton Foundation, then you'd need no no more proof than that. <laughs> The elite definitely like the Clintons, and it's, it's almost comical that we're sitting here with the possibility of a dynasty uh, election, Clinton versus Bush, but it may happen. Uh, but you said something that was actually pretty important, and that's that you know, it, it's n very many people are not aware of what's going on by no fault of their own. They just can't keep up because the intensity of just trying to live day-to-day -day lives is hard enough as it is because of the way our system is set up, you know. So, um, you know, if anything, I, I view that as hopeful because that's a large, say, maybe 30-some-odd percent of the American population that is reachable but are just distracted <laughs> and overwhelmed. Well, I, I think they're going to figure it out because I think people are getting really fed up with Hillary Clinton uh, being having choices between the Bushes and the Clintons. That's not much of a choice at all. I mean, there's there's very little cosmetic differences between both. They're both you know bought and paid for by um, you know large corporations, special interest groups. Um, you know, Hillary's talking about how oh she's poor and all this, but look how much <laughs> money's coming in. I mean, she's a total hypocrite. And she's talking about how there's no economic opportunity for people anymore, and she's getting, you know, her unqualified daughter a six hundred thousand dollars starting salary at a job that she was unqualified for. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, the good news is that people are waking up, and it's just kind of this inverse uh, correlation to how much uh, pain is happening. People are waking up because they are looking around saying, hey, how, how did what is going on in America happen? And the liberty movement, the growth of people paying attention to Ron Paul, uh, you know, those speak to positive trends that will hopefully overcome ignorance and uh, over, uh, a population that's overwhelmed and unable to pay attention politically. Because, you know, as we it's just been reflecting back on what started this whole conversation, as empires age, it's very common for the bread and circuses to basically distract people. And, um, you know, even the monetary system, as it is, uh, pollutes and distorts general morals and uh, work ethic. And, you know, it, 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 the corruption of our monetary system is, in fact, corrupting our, our society you know, with all the various economic problems that we have. I, I completely agree. Now, let's change topics. You started touching on, on the economy. Um, something you've been covering recently is the FDR and the world reserve currency. Um, you, you've been on the record recently uh, on a, with some of your articles on the News Doctors and also um, with the uh, SD, uh, Silver Doctors, Metals and Markets Wrap, talking about how you expect um, maybe by the end of 2015 how there could be a radical change concerning China, the FDR, and their potential announcement of gold reserves. Uh, do you think China's going to uh, actually announce um, an increase in their gold reserves by the end of this year? I do, and the reason why they will most likely do that is because I believe that the inclusion of the renminbi, the Chinese currency, to the SDR basket is extremely highly probable this year. I mean, we have... Uh, Chris, uh, Christian Lagarde talking last month about how the inclusion of the renminbi will be a matter of when, not if, and various high-level Chinese officials have been openly talking about uh, the need for China to be in the basket this year. And, uh, it, it just makes sense for a lot of reasons why uh, China would advocate to have that happen. It gives them more depth in terms of uh, the internationalization of the renminbi. So, I believe that uh, in order to help them beef up the confidence that uh, people have in the renminbi, they'll be making an announcement that would put them in the neighborhood of uh, above Germany but below the United States in terms of their gold holdings. And that would probably be somewhere south of 4,000 metric tons that they would announce. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's announced in the, somewhere around the June time frame, um, plus or minus a month. So <laughs> it's pretty pretty uh, in, in the near term. I mean, the, these, this, it has the potential of uh, rekindling uh, gold demand and changing the way uh, a lot of the conventional Wall Street type thinkers view gold. And uh, when China is included into the SDR basket, it will also um, shape the way in which people nation states uh, look at the U.S. dollar in terms of its role as a reserve currency status. Um, it's going to not result in some kind of massive change overnight. And there is a tendency within the precious metals community to look at dynamics like this and, and think that, oh, gee, you know, it's going to result in the <laughs> dollar losing 20% of its purchasing power in the first month of this announcement or something like that. I don't see that kind of dynamic unfolding, but it will reduce the dollar's purchasing power as uh, we move somewhere from, say, like, I don't know the, the most recent numbers, but I believe it's about 60% that the dollar represents in terms of stored <clears throat> bonds and cash and credit uh, as reserves in nation states around the world to, you know, something on the order of maybe low 50s, high 40s within a year. And that will have an impact. It will send more dollars back home than the United States. It will uh, you know, dilute the purchasing power of the dollar, and, and uh, you know, people are going to notice it in America. Yeah, Eric, I, I don't think most of the global economy can withstand the dollar keep on strengthening relative to other currencies and also the oil price keep on going lower because of how um, most uh, most uh, of the larger, more powerful uh, powerful economies, except for China and Germany, they produce oil. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, they need an oil in a sweet spot there 
where the consumer can afford it and they can also make money producing it, and that's not happening right now. And then you have American, um, you know, these large multinational companies where, you know, a strong dollar uh, hurts their earnings. So, um, yeah, they're using, you know, share buybacks and artificially cheap debt to manufacture higher earnings, but if the dollar keeps going stronger, that's going to hurt their earnings. So I'm sure, you know, these large corporations, uh, these corrupt, uh, corrupt crony capitalists, whether it's General Electric or the banks or whoever, are probably going to the Treasury Department or Ben, uh, not Ben Bernanke, but Janet Yellen, excuse me, and, you know, saying, you know, the dollar is getting too strong. You're hurting our export business. You're hurting our earnings. Um, you know, you should do something about it. I'm sure they're starting to get that type of pressure. Yeah, uh, the Federal Reserve is definitely cognizant of the risk that the stock market would roll over, and one of their main goals has been to elevate asset prices, not just bonds, but stocks and housing and so forth. And the U.S. dollar continuing to rise would just sock the S&P 500 um, international earnings straight uh, in the stomach. I mean, it, it, it has the potential of actually creating a stock market crash later this year. I mean, if we went to a dollar index of 110 or something like that between now and, say, uh, July, August, somewhere around there, um, you know, the, the nervousness of market participants as we move into the fall with the September-October period as being historically one where we typically see big corrections or crashes, uh, that would definitely put not only average investors, but Janet Yellen herself on pins and needles. I mean, I think that's actually one of the bigger risks in this summer time frame, frankly, is if the dollar will continue to rise. Um, I, th I think we've probably seen the bulk of the rise, uh, but there's still a heck of a lot of um, third world debt denominated in dollars that many countries like Brazil and, and others are seeking to and close out the loans and put it back into their own uh, currencies. And in order to do that, they have to actually um, you know, procure the dollars with their own local currency to be able to extinguish the debt. And that's creating this gigantic carry trade. I mean, it's on sort of about $10 trillion worth of uh, dollar-denominated debt that we'll be seeing uh, some forms of clipping around the edges. And that's been putting a bid on the dollar. Uh, the dollar's rise in the last... Uh, like four months, has been faster uh, than almost any other period. I mean, it's been amazing how quickly the dollar has appreciated. Yeah, it, it reminds me, Eric, of 1929, what happened, how the rest of Europe was collapsing, right? And before yeah. October 29 and the U.S. markets crashed, the U.S. markets were going, you know, straight up vertical because all this fly capital was coming back into the U.S. You know, the developing world, a lot of them have commodity, current, uh, commodity uh, economies, a lot of export-driven stuff. And um, their economies have not been doing well. But one thing that you brought up is the dollar-denominated debt. I was thinking, you know, maybe these countries will combine and they'll say, screw the American banks who they took out the loans for. And they'll just say, you know what, we're going to – we have these currency swaps. They're a lot larger than we've reported. You know, we've done them with our trading partners with Russia and China. Um, the developing countries have done them. And they'll say, you know what, let's just strategically default on their dollar-denominated debt and let's just take out new loans the next day in debt in other currencies or something like that with our trading partners. Mm -hmm. So that could be a strategy down the line. I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but it's something that they could do to put a lot of pressure on the U.S. dollar uh, as world reserve currency and also on U.S. banks who uh, can't really afford because they're so leveraged. They can't afford, you know, these uh, these loan losses. I think there's a lot of black swans out there, Eric, now that, you know, we talked earlier a couple months ago. Uh, actually, I think we spoke a little before 2015 started. So we've seen just an enormous amount of black swans in 2015 with enormous volatility. And a lot of it is because of the oil price and the derivatives and these currency wars and the volatility that we're seeing um, across that um, because of the leverage in the system, uh, it can't handle volatility and bankruptcies and write downs and things like that. Yeah. Uh, circling back a bit, I don't think you'd see any kind of mass move amongst Brazil and Argentina and lots of and Venezuela and lots of other countries banding together to abdicate uh, dollar-dominated debt, because that would basically be um, like a, nu uh, a neutron bomb going off in the global financial system that would screw everybody. I mean, it's not likely that you'd see that kind of a coordinated uh, attack. However, one way of looking at this kind of evolutionary process of the IMF SDR taking on more of a greater role in terms of reserve currency status and, in fact, even being part of uh, 
IMF, SDR denominated bond debt and that, that other nations will be able to raise and so forth diversifies away from the dollar. And when, uh, you know, you're president of Brazil or of Argentina or whatever, looking out in the world and trying to figure out how best to navigate uh, your lesser position in the at the table with giants of China and the United States and so forth and the currencies. Uh, I, I think that's probably more likely what we will see unfold going forward. However, uh, examples like Greece are perfect. Uh, examples of one-off scenarios where you may in fact see something that grows out of their situation becoming a black swan where they'll go to the Russians and the Chinese in turn and say, hey, you know, we're being pushed up against the wall. We don't have the ability to pay off the 300 plus billion dollars or excuse me, billion euros that the Troika wants. And as a result, uh, we're going to have to default because they're not um, – willing to give us a haircut of, say, 50% or so of, on our debt, which is what the Greek uh, government has been, in fact, uh, trying to get out of Germany and all the other players. And if Germany and the other players do not acquiesce and decide to play chicken up to the very point of uh, the decision having to be made, uh, it's quite possible that Brexit will happen. Greece will exit the euro, and that uh, it'll find more alliance with uh, Russia and China, and I think the odds of that are increasing. Um, we, we'll have to see where things go, but, uh, you know, the, the Greek government has been tapping pension funds to pay current debts that come due every couple of weeks. <laughs> this whole dance between the Greeks and, and the Troika has been almost like a, a sad comedy. Uh, the, 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 the pattern has been that from, for a period of time they'll set a deadline and then they'll negotiate up to that point in time and say, okay, let's kick the can down the road. Here's a, a, a pack of money that you can uh, continue to meet your needs with, and then that's it. I mean, it, the, uh, the situation is never resolved, and I don't think it's probably going to be resolved. I think the odds actually of Greece exiting are pretty decent, and that fits along with the black swan scenario that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, Eric, I think all these countries, whether it's Japan or the United States or Europe, you know, the, some of the individual companies in your uh, countries, excuse me, in Europe, um, China, um, a lot of these countries from their monetary policy and fiscal policy using, using, you know, Keynesian economics and mercantilism and devaluing their currencies and manipulating interest rates lower with financial oppression, I think they're essentially trapped. Um, you know, there, there's very little options. You know, they only have one or two options, and it's either, you know, take – a lot of pain now, or it's a lot of pain in a couple of years. So they're, they've, they've run themselves with these bad Keynesian policies to the point now where um, I think basically almost every country is trapped with the, uh, the options it has on the table. Yeah, I agree. Um, my, my next question for you uh, has to do with the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, longtime allies for the United States, Israel, uh, Britain, uh, we've seen them, I guess, hedge their bets and start to join the Asian Infrastructure Bank. And I think even China invited the U.S. to, to join it recently, even though they weren't a, uh, initially asked. But now I think they were recently asked to join it, and I think the U.S. declined. Um, why do you think China is starting the um, Asian Infrastructure Bank? It's this process of diversifying the world economy away from dollar dominance that they're most interested in, as well as uh, growing out – business opportunities and, and solidifying its relationships with nations all over the world, but in Asia in particular, and this development bank will help facilitate that. I mean, there's an enormous amount of opportunity for infrastructure development and just business development in general in the Asia region, and I mean, I've seen figures where people are kicking around at numbers as large as like $25 trillion worth of investment coming through this institution within the next 15 some odd years. I mean, it's a very significant development on the international stage. I love how you uh, talked about it in terms of nations hedging their bets and joining uh, as far as traditional U.S. allies. Because I think <laughs> similar to what we were talking about before when it came to the, you know, the overall doom and gloom tendencies of the precious metals community, there's been a lot of um, over-the-top analysis when it comes to the AIIB, uh, you know, when it, the Israeli decision to join the uh, broke. Uh, people were looking at that as the 
know, penultimate uh, punch in the face when it comes to U.S. allies and, um, and so forth. But this is really, it's important to put this in the perspective of a decade plus long um, you know, frame of reference because that's where the Chinese are coming from. They see this as an evolutionary development that will help uh, build out their uh, global economic dominance in the long run, and that is, in fact, their goal. So in the short run, uh, all the various things that China is doing in terms of trying to liberalize its uh, international, uh, or rather its domestic uh, financial markets for international investment and uh, the freely convertible uh, status of the RMB, which will probably come within not too long from now. I mean, it technically would be a prerequisite for them to be part of the SDR basket with a freely convertible RMB and an open capital account such that investors all over the world can come in and do whatever they please within the financial markets in China. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily going to um, be a hard prerequisite for them because I suspect they're going to hold off a little bit longer when it comes to those type of dynamics. But um, the uh, new development bank, as it is now called, what formerly was known as the BRICS Bank, and the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Agreement, the, you know, all of these various institutional uh, organizations that it will help facilitate the geopolitical and economic power of, of China are all interrelated. And it, you know, if you look at the use of the RMB for uh, uh, trade settlement, I mean, it's gone from mere uh, small percentage of global trade being settled in the RMB only five, six, six, seven years ago to now you know, being the second largest uh, currency in terms of settlement of the sale of goods and services worldwide. China's on the rise. It's, you know, if you look at um, in terms of purchase power parity of what the yuan can purchase within China and measure their economy based on um, the production of goods and services that can be uh, procured by the purchase power parity metric or the economists, you know, they, they you know, compare and contrast the, the various buying powers of you know, dollar versus renminbi and, and so forth. And if you measure the amount of goods and services that are being procured by the uh, Chinese economy, uh, relative in adjusting for its currency, they're on par with the United States in terms of uh, their size of their economy. I mean, they're now the second largest economy by far. And uh, when you look at it in terms of just the net economic activity that's going on uh, adjusted for their currency, they are, in fact, you know, right on par with the United States. So <laughs> from yeah. – They've compressed like 150 some odd years of industrial revolution growth in, in 15 or 20. It's, it's astounding, and that momentum you know, has only, and the relative to the United States, hasn't slowed at all. I mean, their economy is slowing somewhat this year. Maybe they'll have a six or 6.5 percent growth, but uh, that is now based on uh, a six to 10 trillion plus uh, economy. I mean, it, 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 China is a power that the United States is going to have to wrestle with and, and deal with. And so we'll, we'll see all of these various dynamics with the SDR involving later this year, and more and more people are going to be cognizant of the fact that the dollar is no longer king and that it's on a decline. But it will, it will be most likely a kind of evolutionary process with fits and starts. Yeah, I mean, what, uh, the U.S.'s foreign policy towards China, you know, is, is fairly aggressive. It's um, They've ch done some uh, military training, I think, in the South China Sea. But, um, you know, in terms of U.S.'s economic relationship with China, it can't sever the ties right now. The U.S. just – the U.S.'s companies and importing of Chinese goods is just too reliant on the Chinese economy right now for the U.S.'s economy to be self-sufficient. The, the, uh, the U.S. economy, you know, can't decouple – uh, it can't, you know, shake loose the rest of the world and survive on its own. The global economy is too integrated. Um, I think the mistake a lot of, um, you know, Austrian school economists, libertarians, people, uh, people who are saying the dollar was going to hyperinflate, and, you know, eventually it probably will, um, although probably every other currency will too, 
uh, at one point, or we may, I don't know if we'll see full hyperinflation, but we'll, at least we'll see much worse inflation. Let's just put it that way. Maybe much worse stagflation, maybe hyperinflation in other currencies like the Japanese yen or developing world countries who can't issue their own debt or in bol- borrowed in dollars. But um, I, I think, you know, when they were saying the dollar was going to collapse in, uh, prior to 2008 or in 2008, there just wasn't the infrastructure in place for um, for us to for us as a global economy to move on to the next system. There just wasn't all these the necessary steps in place to put in you know another type of Bretton Woods type system to reestablish a new global financial system prior to 2008. And I think after 2008, you know that stuff accelerated. We've seen uh, a lot of things in place. You know, new currency swaps, a new SWIFT system, uh, this Asian infrastructure bank, which has grown rapidly. The RMB, you know, being uh, nationalized, much um, uh, internationalized, excuse me. Um, and then, um, you know, that next logical step before China, I guess, ultimately, the, ultimately they do want the world reserve currency sometime in the future, maybe decades away, is to um, is to put themselves the RMB into the SDR. Yeah, and it's a multi-course uh, track. I mean, their strategy, as we were talked about in the last time um, we spoke, and I think it was like late December. Um, you know, a lot of people in the precious metals community are very skeptical of the work that Jim Rickards does and you know, his advocacy and illustration of what he sees in the future as far as China joining the SDR basket and so forth has, has received a bit of flack. But um, the reality is that China is rather pragmatic about all of this stuff. They're building all of these alternative institutions as a parallel track that will allow them to advance their commerce and their business interests, uh, in turn supporting their geopolitical needs. Yet at the same time, they're still playing ball with the West, and they're uh, moving along with this SDR uh, basket inclusion strategy, and I think it's actually pretty smart on their part. I mean, they will definitely benefit by um, going in an incremental fashion to uh, increasing the amount of renminbi use for reserve status and trade settlement status worldwide in the SDR basket will help facilitate that. Yeah, and China's winning a lot of allies. You know, instead of the U.S., you know, doing drone strikes with other people or doing regime changes with what the U.S. foreign policy does or banks with owner's debt, China's giving, um, you know, this new Asian infrastructure bank, I think their their goal is to give out much smaller loans than what the IMF or World Bank give out so that actual infrastructure projects in Africa and South America, those things can be built, yeah. that um, infrastructure is actually needed. You know, the IMF and World Bank claim that that's what they do, but they really don't do that. They do these big, large, white elephant type projects where, you know, GE, uh, GE uh, these crony capitalist uh, companies like General Electric and these other ones, you know, they make tens of billions of dollars. Uh, the construction firms make it and stuff like that. And, um, you know, they don't really help uh, a, a lot of people that much and people can't pay back debt that large. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And fleshing that out further, so people can understand the context, I mean, we really have to look at where the Brenton Woods institutions came from and, and what was going on at the day in which, uh, the, you know, in that point in time, 1944, the United States was about to, uh, with their, her allies, win World War II. And following World War II, the United States represented 50% of the global uh, production of goods and services. I mean, our economy and our empire was huge. And we had an absolute military dominance as well with the monopoly of nuclear weapons. And when you consider that context um, and ask yourself, well, okay, if you're in this position and you have this giant empire, what are you going to do to maintain it? Well, <laughs> the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, were um, used for many reasons and many ways, but one of the things that grew out of the execution of their day-to-day activities is stuff that was very well illuminated by John Perkins in uh, the the Confessions of an Economic Hitman book that he released, I think it was back in 2004 or something. But uh, he talked a lot about how the IMF structural adjustment programs would uh, set up uh, nations to take debt and in turn um, require them to offer uh, favorable pricing for resources that they would sell on the international markets and uh, keep uh, leaders in line when it comes to you know, geopolitical alliances with the United States, and, and uh, the World Bank would make 
as you were discussing, the gigantic investments, white elephant projects and so forth that would employ uh, in Bechtel, GE, and, and on and on, you know, major companies in the West, uh, and the purchase of our goods and services to, in fact, you know, fill out the business development that was being invested in by the World Bank. So there was always this kind of ulterior motive behind these institutions that were focused on building of empire, or maintenance of empire, better said. And when you consider the difference that China sees now uh, as an, a, an emerging power seeking to get a larger and larger you know, slice of the global economic pie and a big kid on the block being the United States with all of these Brenton Woods institutions helping to facilitate the maintenance of the Anglo-American empire, uh, you kind of can see why there's these qualitative differences in the way in which the philosophy of the Chinese uh, shape the way they do business around the world with all of these various relationships that they've, in the last five years in particular, uh, sped up. I mean, there must be probably like 28 bilateral currency relationships with China now. I mean, uh, they're, they have been extremely aggressive in, in trying to do business as a uh, way in which to expand their empire as opposed to uh, keeping restrictions on countries through the Brenton Woods uh, institutions I just outlined or outright uh, divide and conquer and uh, empire of chaos as the thesis that you know, Pablo Escobar speaks about I mean, all these things are going on on the West and when it comes to trying to flail about to keep a hold of a diminishing empire. And, yeah, maybe maybe the world at large will get lucky and with you know, diversification away from the dollar with the SDR basket and maybe with a financial crash that <laughs> wakes people up and makes people second-guess assumptions in terms of the hubris and aggressiveness of our foreign policy establishment, uh, then we'll see some kind of change in the future. But, I mean, it, it just doesn't look promising with uh, the level of aggression that you can see in particular theaters of war like the Ukraine and the Middle East. Uh, this is 2015 is probably going to be a pretty darn interesting year. I, I continue to think that we're going to see much more escalation when it comes to warfare. Well, th this is what happens, Eric, in the U.S. when um, we lose our way, when um, lawyers and bureaucrats and people who haven't run a business or know what it takes to uh, to sacrifice to achieve a goal, a uh, long-term goal, you know, honestly, you know, not through graft or stealing or theft or lying or immoral uh, immoral acts. Or it could be uh, no. financialization. I mean, that's yeah. probably, the, in terms of economics, is the biggest problem the United States has found itself in. We're in a big hole and we continue to dig. I mean, financialization has been a very potent uh, growth uh, oh. uh, force within you know, the last 40 years. But I, I agree, though, the derivatives market and, and, and all those things. But once you go down the debt-based fiat currency uh, track and, you know, credit growth cycles, I mean, Chris Martinson had a good chart, I think, in his newest uh, in his newest set of videos, the crash course, showing how there was a little blip in the drop of credit in 2008. And, you know, that caused everything to crash. So right. we're in a, right. yeah, yeah, so we're in an exponential system here where the money supply essentially maybe for a year or two it can sl slow down its rate of growth, but ultimately has to keep growing rapidly and same with the credit. You know, this is what happens um, where they start uh, doing stupid things with the money and, um, you know, subprime auto loans, student loan debt. Um, you know, we can go down the list of uh, all the different all the different asset bubbles and credit bubbles that are being created right now. But I, I think China, um, from its policy perspective, you know, they're they're winning more allies trying to do trade, trying to create win win scenarios. And the U.S. used to do this. I mean, the U.S. wasn't wasn't always like this foreign policy wasn't always like this or maybe it was to a smaller extent but it was never you know this encompassing where this was the only thing that people in power would think about i mean the u.s used to be a lot more business and trade oriented and entrepreneurial and things like that but um i think we've in a lot of aspects lost our way outside of uh, silicon valley yeah and also there's qualitative differences in terms of you know colonialism versus and financial imperialism and the financialization that we just spoke about i mean the last you know since World War two the United States has been more so about financialization and financial imperialism uh, than in previous periods i mean the the colonial structure of empires um didn't necessarily per preclude 
include trade and its growth. It just had a, a local tin pot dictator who was amenable to you know, U.S. or uh, England or France or what have you in all the earlier colonial periods. And so, you know, you had a different different way in which the overall humming of the global economic engine on balance, you know, on, on average, taking in the whole global scene uh, operated. And, and nowadays it is so much more, um, you know, concentrated finance that dominates things and shapes the way uh, political elites see their geopolitical imperatives and so forth. Um, my, my final question for you before I let you go has to do with the precious metals. You know, we, we've seen them in a in an artificial bear market where the paper price has just been under control. The cartel has capped it, as you say, on the SD metals and markets wrap for uh, really since 2011. In my opinion, the manipulation has increased. Um, do, do you think if precious metals do rise, do you, do you think um, it's a high probability event then that we're going to see windfall profits taxes or or mines nationalized or things like that? That's a tough question. Uh, I believe that we'll probably see windfall profit taxes in the United States and many other uh, Western economies in particular. And nationalization in uh, countries like uh, Argentina or South Africa are almost a foregone conclusion at some point if we have <laughs> a lot more turmoil and also higher prices of gold. Um, I don't see that happening in the United States or Canada. Uh, so there are jurisdictions where I think that it's reasonably high probability that you can assume that if you hold shares in your direct possession or in uh, outside a street name at a corporate registrar, that uh, if you have solid companies, that you know mining shares will probably be a, a pretty decent investment because they're so enormously over undervalued at this point. As long as you got a you know company management team and properties that make sense and and so on and so forth, but there's no doubt that gold and silver will rise. Uh, it's only a question of when and by how much and what kind of conditions around the world are such that uh, that it shapes the trajectory of where you know gold in particular and silver will follow in turn will go. I mean, it's possible that we may have a, a debt reset. Uh, currency resets, uh, and, and these kind of things conceivably could see over the weekend shifts in the price of gold. Um, I don't think that's going to happen in 2015. I think we have these initial stages with the SDR basket rejiggering and lots and lots of turmoil around the world when it comes to countries like Greece, maybe exiting the euro and so forth, and all of these things conceivably uh, will you know, put a bid under the you know, Price of gold and silver, but I, I still you know, continue to see you know the, the major shifts being a little bit further out in time, maybe 2016. So the good news for precious metals investors is that uh, if China is to come out in this summer and speak about you know something shy of 4,000 metric tons, as opposed to their last declaration of 1,054 tons, I think they made in 2009 that uh, that's going to probably put a stake in the heart of this uh, ongoing bear market phase that we've been laboring through as the cartel continues to extend the duration of this bear market. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a good year for precious metals. I think you know, silver and gold will rise 20 30% over January 1st so, you know, pricing. But, you know, yeah, I, I I tend to agree with that. Um, I think we could see you know twenty two dollars silver by the end of the year approximately, and I think I said thirteen hundred or thirteen fifty gold. Those were my initial projections in January for the whole year. I said I'd like to see those numbers, but um, you know, to add to your points there about why precious metals could go higher, I think eventually the market, the Wall Street people who are you know very short term oriented and myopic, only look at the charts. That's why they won't buy gold right now. I think they're going to figure out the Federal Reserve is trapped. Um, in terms of being able to raise interest rates, that they can only raise it maybe a token amount. And if they raise it a token amount, you know, there could be drastic ramifications and reverberations throughout the entire global economy for them doing so. And then they'll panic and probably try to lower rates again. And, um, you know, it, it just seems that these uh, governments, especially in the Western world, are committed to financial oppression. So you add that, plus you add China uh, restating their gold reserves higher. Obviously, I don't think they're going to they're gonna list their real number. So if they have 10 or 20,000 tons, 
as uh, I think Jim Wally states they do. Uh, you know, they're not going to say, come out and say, you know, we have 20,000 tons of physical gold. They'll, they'll say the numbers, like you said earlier in the interview, they'll, they'll announce a higher number, but it'll still be a dramatic understatement. And then, um, the other thing that's on, that's kind of on the demand side, I guess, for Chinese demand, but the, um, and Kuz Jansen's numbers support that, you know, him looking up, uh, the Shanghai Gold Exchange over the Bad World Gold Council numbers, which I think are fraudulent. Yeah. Um, but, but the, the other thing is the supply side. Um, the, the actual gold market on an exchange is not a large market. We don't know what all the over-the-counter transactions are for physical gold, right. but I think there's only about 4,000 tons of gold on an exchange that move, and the mining supply makes up a big deal of that. And if the miners are in this dire of financial straits where, you know, if the metals prices don't go higher or they go lower, um, you know, we're going to see um, – I interviewed Keith Newmeyer uh, last week of First Majestic Silver. That interview should be posted this week, uh, sometime this week. But, you know, he said he's cut costs uh, approximately 40%, I think, in the last 18 to 24 months. I don't think every miner has been able to do that. They just have too high a cost mines with low grades and, um, you know, bad uh, uh, bad capital costs and stuff. Maybe they've been able to cut the, the mine pr the costs a little bit, maybe 15 20% last 18 months or so, but not 30, 40, 50 percent, even with the low oil prices, Eric, um, that we've seen, you know, which are a, a, a big bonus to miners. I think the oil prices have dropped 50 percent since June. These miners are not reporting earnings, even with a, a much lower oil price that should have cut their costs a lot. Yeah, we're going to see a very significant reduction in supply going forward. I mean, you know, 20 percent is not out of the question when it comes to gold. And, you know, if you listed the fundamentals that are in favor of higher gold and silver prices now uh, versus, say, the beginning of the bull market, I believe we have more positive factors now and in terms of the relative value of gold and silver that, in fact, that this is best time that we've seen ever in this entire bull move to purchase gold and silver. Uh, so I agree. It, it, it's, it's a great time for precious metals investors because for the most part, everybody hates the sector. I mean, I, it's very, very hard to find uh, people who are openly bullish about uh, the precious metal sector, and in fact, even in the precious metal space, uh, and people are despondent. They're angry. <laughs> we get a whole cascade of negative comments when any forecaster makes a particularly bullish or even, even to some extent, bland forecast these days. And it, it's... It, it's a very interesting time in the precious metal space, so I'm looking forward to you know the year as it evolves. Yeah, this this is uh, me too. But this is normally like what the bottom of markets look like from a sentiment perspective. You That's know, right. you see you see some good fundamental stuff, but sentiment is just absolutely horrible. That you know people just roll their eyes at any of the positive fundamental news, like how it, you know India is importing mass amounts of physical silver. Uh, the demand for silver on the industrial side for solar is way more than it was when the uh, silver bull market started. You know, silver panels were were way too expensive, and it was only a government project, and the costs hadn't fallen really at all. And, um, you know, even though silver's not fully, uh, excuse me, solar's not fully economic yet, the costs on these panels have come down, and governments are just committed to these things at, um, you know, in the lab. They're drastically lowering the cost of the panels. China's helped lower the cost of the panels with mass manufacturing. So, um, you know, silver is getting a, a lot more interesting demand perspect, uh, perspective on the industrial side long term. Um, it, it excites me um, it, from that respect for the silver market, at least, although, you know, gold is not used um, as the uh, industrial behemoth that silver is because there's uh, not thousands of uses for, for gold, and um, most of the gold is not in a landfill in small amounts. Yeah, and when you look at the supply and demand dynamics going on now, I mean, China all by herself will probably consume the entire mine supply generated for gold this year. The uh, Indians consumed 125 metric tons in March, and that puts them at a run rate that this year will put India as uh, you know, consuming more gold than it ever has before in history. Uh, same will, can be said for China as well. I mean, there's just... There's not enough supply to meet ongoing demand. The deficit has been serviced by the liquidation of central bank holdings as well as rating of GLD and other uh, private vaults. And uh, we can document this by looking at flows that go through the refiners in Switzerland and uh, other ways in which you can you know, look at the 
different vaults in the in the GLD bar count is probably uh, it's probably not accurate, but uh, they still nonetheless declare what they hold, and uh, we've seen a halving of the GLD's gold vault in the last two years. So we're living on borrowed time in terms of being able to satiate this enormous physical demand for gold, and all the while you have the exchanges of the LBMA and the comics playing games with paper where you know people are trading at 100 and probably higher ratios of uh, you know, ounces compared to what's actually in the vaults in these uh, you know, exchanges. So uh, India is even talking about trying to coerce or cajole temples to liberate their 3,000 metric tons of gold over the course of the next couple of years and stick it into a, you know, some kind of a scheme for certificate project products where they would sell uh, gold out into the open market and at the same time promise uh, temple uh, monks and <laughs> administrators that they get an interest payment and so forth. So if that story alone actually speaks to how desperate the um, you know the international banking system is to find gold to make uh, its function as a smoke alarm fail to go off. I mean, we have all these various instabilities with, you know, interest rates that are at the fall intent and purposes, record lows um, you know, pretty much around the world. And that condition is underpinning this hyper-liquidity, false uh, economic reality that we're living in. And gold as the smoke alarm for the financial system that can sound off when uh, you have either uh, a credit worthiness risk or inflation. You know, it isn't just a, an inflation has that gold serves, but you know, the market participants were they to correctly price where gold should be vis-a-vis -vis its role as a smoke alarm in the financial system, conceivably would destabilize the entire financial system, and that's in fact why there is a war on gold and. It isn't a conspiracy theory. It's very well documented. Anybody that you know spends oh five hours or so over the course of a month in Gata's archive at Gata.org will clearly see that the documentation is really extensive. There's, it, it's 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 amusing to watch and and listen to market pundits speak about how you know the bond markets managed, the stock market is benefiting from buybacks, and everything is elevated and. You know, at the same time, when it comes to all, you know, uh, freely willingness to admit to you know, market management by the powers to be on all of these various uh, assets, it's almost like a vampire seeing uh, the cross when it comes to dealing honestly with what is going on in the gold market, in particular in silver secondarily. I mean, the reality is that it's massively manipulated. It's probably more manipulated than any other market in history. And that's precisely because of its importance as a uh, uh, you know, smoke alarm. It would, Greenspan called gold the barometer of the financial system. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think all markets are manipulated to a certain degree, like you said, but yeah. the gold market seems to be one. But eventually they're going to have problems. The West is sourcing physical gold. And, um, you know, I think GLD and SLV are definitely running on fumes. I actually just got an email today from my friend David Jansen, if you know him. He's a right. precious metals expert out of Vancouver. And in the email, he said, according to the Turkish Statistical Institute, um, and I could send you the email and the link later with the source, Turkey's gold bar exports to England are up 10,800%. Yes, I said 10,800% to 545 million in January and February of 2015 from 2014, so he thinks that means that GLD is fully tapped out. That's a massive amount of uh, extra imports of gold um, from Turkey into uh, England. Hmm. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I haven't seen that story yet. Okay, great. Well, um, uh, thanks again for your time, Eric. Uh, please tell our listeners more about the News Doctors and also uh, about your role over at Silver Doctors. So Silver Doctors uh, is a bullion and information service and I produce a podcast with John, a.k.a. The Doc, over on Silver Doctors. Uh, it usually airs on Saturday, and we produce it on Friday. It's kind of a weekly recap of metals, market dynamics in general, geopolitics, and so forth. And The News Doctors, and it has the in the front. It's 
thenewsdoctors.com is a uh, information portal that covers news all across the world, but with an emphasis on geopolitics and finance. And on uh, the right side of the page, if you scroll down, you'll see my name and Wall Street for Main Street and various other uh, of our more frequent contributors. So if you're curious to know stuff that I have written recently or podcasts I'm involved with, it'll always be indexed by just clicking on my name. You'll be able to pull up the stories. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks again for your time. I really enjoyed it. And uh, we'll have you on again in a couple months for more talk about the geopolitical situation.